Do you need to turn off the light? I don't believe so unless okay. everybody can see it. or as a vocation. So um, you don't necessarily have to be a professional or work in that field to be part of a vocation mm -hmm. or a professional in that career. So we don't usually use the words profession because that's what you do, but cybersecurity can actually extend beyond that. Mm -hmm. yeah. as, a, as a common practice, whether or not it's whether or not for, for pay or just everyday life. Alright, how are we doing? So we got 1033, and I know we don't have a whole lot of time, everybody. So as people come in, that's okay. Uh, but I am J.D. Henry. I work for the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. I am the Cybersecurity Advisor for Region 7. Uh, Region 7 covers the state of Iowa, Kansas, Missouri, and Nebraska. I, uh, I go around and I work mostly with critical infrastructure, and we'll talk about what that is. And I deal a lot with utilities and ICS and SCADA, and we'll talk a little bit about how that, what that means. So but today's topic, and what I'm going to talk to you about for about the next 10 minutes, is cybersecurity's vocation, uh, whether or not you go into it as a profession, or, or whether or not it's just a practice that you use in your job, uh, because your job will all most definitely include cybersecurity in one shape or form or another. So everybody here, I mean, looking around, uh, mostly younger students I can see. So um, I'll, I'll tell you where I started. So, so that's little me. That's probably around 1986. And I can tell it's about 1986 because this is a Commodore 64. Came out right around 1982, 1983. That's an Amiga. It didn't come out until 1985, so I know it's after that. Uh, that Amiga had a color monitor as opposed to just the green screen. It took three and a half inch floppies instead of the five and quarters. But you'll see I'm putting in a five and a quarter disc there. There's a joystick, a really nice dot matrix printer. Uh, and this was the specs, the basic specs on a Commodore 64. So 1.02 megahertz is what the processing speed of that was and 64 kilobytes of RAM. Pretty good for $600 back then. That's a lot of RAM for a, for a personal computer. To give you an idea of what my Galaxy S9 or my kid's Xbox One is, you start seeing that megahertz jump into gigahertz, uh, and then you start seeing RAM also jump from that kilobit all the way down to, to gigabit. And the display, I didn't put the display obviously for the Xbox because it's whatever monitor you're using, whether you're, you're 4K uh, LCD or, um, but it, Regardless, you'll see that the color schemes from Quad HD to 65,536 possible color schemes as opposed to the 16 colors that my Commodore could actually be able to support. You'll see that that's, that trend has continued. Uh, we always say that eventually it's going to slow down. It never has. And we don't see anything with the way that we're actually making chips today and then the silicon that we're using and, and the way that we're creating more transistors onto those chips and be able to process more and more data, uh, there is no slowdown. And the more data we can process, the more exposed we are to be able to lose that data, and the more risk we have for cybersecurity. So why do I do what I do for Department of Homeland Security? So this is an Aurora generator. And I'm going to show you a little video while I talk about this. And an Aurora generator is used within the power grid. And in 2007, the Idaho National Labs, as part of the Department of Homeland Security, wanted to see whether or not they could do a destructive effect on a physical asset using nothing but cybersecurity. And stops up. Uh, good switch. I'll show the video. Yeah. Can we jump out of the presentation? Of course. Cool. I'm sorry. Oh, 
show you the video. All right, so the Aurora generator, I think that I'm set up for dual monitors, I think is probably part of my problem. Security's done an excellent job in locking down this machine so that I cannot go ahead and do a lot of the things. So my embedded links that I put into PowerPoint, mm -hmm. all those things have been uh, disabled. Here we go. I am set up for dual monitors, which is part of the issue. So, this up. Play. So this is a rotor generator. It cost about a million dollars. They put 21 lines of code into it. Uh, they did this in 2007. So 20 line, 21 lines of code, they're able to affect the relays on this generator. The generator itself, you're going to see it, has a big spinning rod in it that's created electricity, and it has three different phases. It weighs more than a dump truck, and you can see it jumping. What's really happening is it's tearing itself aside, it's part inside. It's exploding. Uh, because you're taking those phases out it's creating a lot of centrifugal force and it's being able to pull in different directions on that rod. And they did this with 21 lines of code that are just affecting circuit breakers. And you see the smoke. So it is actually exploding on the inside. You'll see now the valves are starting to break. And this was all done via cyber. Nobody touched it. We remoted in and we were able to do that. That was in 2007. So in 2007, that's, and you'll see here's the glass walls in case it didn't actually explode or crack the actual chassis and the casing of it. That's about the size of a major, you know, bulldozer. So to see it jump like that, you're lifting about 10,000 pounds. That's how much force is going on inside, and that's what affects our power grid. So, let me get back to our presentation. And so that's one of the things that we're, we're trying to protect against so that we want to make sure that incidents like this... Grammarly does more than catch errors. Uh -huh. With that's the next video. Really good. <laughs> no, perfect words. I think you're writing sharp or explicit or excellent or distinctive. <laughs> Thank you. So we had a power outage in 2003 that did a northwest blackout. It started something similar very much to this generator. Uh, so that entire power grid, the eastern interconnect, which covers most of the United States here on the eastern coast from the Mississippi over and into Canada, started to have Cascadian blackouts. Um, I say that because this was in 2003 that that incident occurred. 2007 is when we proved that we could actually do it. In 2015, the Ukraine on December 23rd had a power outage that affected almost 230,000 people. And what happened was is that attackers were able to get in, manipulate the systems, and start turning off breakers to three different power utilities. And just before Christmas, they were able to turn off all of their power for up to six hours. That was with a malware variant called Black Energy. The following year, on December 17th, the attackers came back in. They used a much more sophisticated uh, means of what's called Indestroyer or Crash Override, a malware family that was specifically designed to target the power grid. So that exists now. And it's very terrifying that somebody has those kind of uh, abilities to be able to go in and the Kiev attack on the power transportation system, it did not even have all of the actual modules that it could do turned on. So it could have been much more devastating. It looked more like they were just testing its capability to see whether or not it was a proof of concept that they could attack. And then after 2016, you also see a lot more problems within the Ukraine as far as actual Crimea, and you'll see a lot of political things that happened. So a lot of these things you'll see are sometimes precursors to even much more wide-scale kinetic or physical type attacks. Uh, so these are the things that Homeland Security is looking at pretty much every day, and how we protect critical infrastructure we rely on. So when I talk about critical infrastructure, I'm talking about these 16 different things. 
So whether or not it's your drinking water to make sure it's clean or wastewater is being managed correctly, whether or not it's your energy and power like we're talking about, the dams, critical manufacturing used to be able to produce the goods and services you need, healthcare. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we talk about that we rely on every single day and we take for granted, but those are the things that I focus with on my job. <coughs> so why is that important for you guys and why do I bring that up? Um, Cybersecurity in the workforce is a, undergoing a huge challenge. And they say, but by 2022, we are going to be a workforce shortage of cybersecurity professionals by 1.8 million people. So there's definitely room, and we definitely need more and more people to start looking at this, at this as a vocation. Whether or not it's the IT side, or it's the operational technology that I deal with in the critical infrastructure side. Alone, in, in the far right, you'll see in Iowa, Currently, there's already 2,400 jobs that are vacant right now that are being posted for cybersecurity professionals in the state of Iowa. So there's definitely room for if you guys are interested in this as a profession. And we would love to be able to you know, make sure that we can help and grow. So Homeland Security also partners with the National Security Agency. We have Cyber Corps, which are scholarship programs to where we'll help pay for your school and give you a stipend. Uh, it just, you will provide three, I think it's three years of service to the federal service. Uh, there's centers for academic excellence at different universities throughout the country. So we're really trying to address this workforce challenge. Now that's a little bit about what I do. We've only got about 45 minutes, and uh, there's uh, four speakers, so I'm the first one. This is who I am. If you want to take a picture, you guys can always call me. I hope you do. Uh, if you have questions or you're, uh, if you have, you need help with your homework or you're something about cybersecurity, you know, there's my email address. I'll get back to you. Uh, I absolutely love to be able to do what I can. I am Iowa's cybersecurity advisor. Uh, I'm the only one. So if you want to take a picture, you want to call, you want to find out more, there's a lot of resources. So I think uh, if you guys ever need anything, I hope you reach out. And if you have any questions, I'll be here. I'll be speaking again on the other room at uh, 1 o'clock today on the different resources that we provide to critical infrastructure. So that, that's all I got for you. Thank yeah, you. you're very welcome. Will you be, uh, Thank you for having me. Will you be providing your slide decks on the conference website? I usually provide some things. Uh, we usually don't provide our decks. Uh, okay. We usually provide a different resource set that goes through HR and our, all and of our goals. external affairs yes. and all of those things. Yeah, yeah. So they have to approve all that. So they have their own messaging. They don't like it when I share like videos and things like that. <laughs> So, with that, I am going to plug and hand it over there. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a good spot. I don't know what kind of power